All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. We have our distinguished canine uh, fan <laughs> named Kyrie, um, whose haircut is not quite as exotic as usual. Have you given her a haircut? Her top knot's not quite as high as it usually is. It is, right. Right. So she'll roll around on the floor and try to distract everyone from the actual presence of <laughs> Lavros. No, I'm fine here. with that. <laughs> <laughs> Upstaged by a dog, right? So It's a worthy dog. There she is. Do you know, years and years ago, I actually persuaded Ian Rankin to wear a kilt to do an event here at the store. <laughs> and, then, and then I brought my dog, and Ian said to me, the only person I would have worn the kilt for, and you're the only person that would have upstaged me <laughs> with a dog. I felt really badly. But anyway, <laughs> we're here tonight for the first appearance of Lev A.C. Rosen, author of children's books and of last year's huge success, Lavender House. And tonight he's here with Bell in the Fog, or as Patrick recently called it, The Body in the Fog. Which <laughs> <laughs> I really love that, Patrick, because, you know, I do that sort of thing often, but... Um, Anyway, we sent out an announcement with the wrong title, so we had to do it <laughs> over again. But Spoilers. I know. I know. It's just so funny. But anyway, we are here in 1950s, early 1950s San Francisco, which is slightly before my time in San Francisco, which really began in 1956 when I went to look at Stanford in 1958 when I enrolled. And, you know, the era, the, the change was really rapid. Mm -hmm. um, even in the 50s, but the San Francisco that I went to in 1958 was an extremely formal city where people wore white gloves and the whole bit. When I left in the early 60s, we had Haight-Asbury and the whole flower chart thing. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever seen a urban culture change as fast as San Francisco did in those few years. Oh, yeah. No, the, one of my primary research books uh, essentially is like Queer San Francisco up until 1965, and it's just wild watching the 50s through 65 happen. Yeah, well, the war made a, you know, made a big difference, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, just, it wasn't just the war. It was a whole lot of things. So Lavender House is basically an Agatha Christie uh, with a gay cast and sent in a set, sorry, not sent, try it again, set in a large country estate kind of home north of San Francisco. So that must have been fun for you. Had you were you an Agatha Christie reader, or how did you light upon that particular structure for Lavender House? Uh, well, I mean, I always knew that I wanted to write a queer mystery, and uh, I because I grew up on mysteries, I grew up on noir, and I was looking for a way in, but I hadn't really known what that was until we were watching an adaptation of an Agatha Christie uh, 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 book. I think it was Ordeal by Innocence, I think the prime mm -hmm. one, okay. which is pretty fun and camp. And I remember watching it and saying, you know it would be fun? If everyone were gay. <laughs> and then... At, at that moment, I was like, oh, that's my way in. That's what I'm yeah. going to do. And uh, realizing that, like, I could and <laughs> that I did. Um, so that, it, it, yeah, Christy really was the the door to what I wanted to do with Lavender House and this series. Right. But I think one reason that the mystery, we've been out to dinner and I at least have been drinking, so I'll allow for that. Um, but I think one reason that the mystery community embraced Lavender House as warmly as it did is that it was familiar in the sense that it had the Agatha Christie country house structure. Now, for those of you who are confusing the locked room mystery and the country house structure, they're completely different things. Do you want to explain what they are? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this at dinner. So the country house mystery is sort of an isolated space with a, a uh, set cast of suspects, whereas a locked room is literally sort of like a dead body in a locked room. How did this happen situation? Is that about right? Well, it's an impossible crime. The whole point impossible, of a locked yeah. room mystery is not why who is not motive or um, or who, it's how. Mm. How how did the crime occur? Whereas in a country house murder, you're back to the basics of, you know, motive and opportunity 
and character and so forth. But I brought it up because I see locked rooms sort of thrown around um, a lot and inappropriately. Um, <laughs> and um, and I think it's good to I think it's good to sort of straighten that out. So one of the other things we talked about was that Christy, and I know this because last night by chance I watched a 1980s production of Poirot. I'm trying to remember what it was called. Uh, doesn't really matter. Um, with David Suchet, and I think it was the first David Suchet doing Poirot. And basically, it's a private detective story. Mm-hmm. You know, he's hired, or a woman comes to him um, and wants to know why her cook, she lives in Clapham, why has her cook disappeared? And Poirot instantly links this to um, a bank and bonds going missing in it wasn't so much the cook as the cook's trunk, which was conveniently sized to carry a body. Um, that was the whole point of it. But, I mean, it was a really a private detective kind of story. So she was a very versatile author. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, actually, now that you're talking about the trunk, I think now that you're talking about the trunk, uh, I remember seeing that one in the past couple of years, too, because my parents are always watching the various paros. They're, like, always on in the house when I'm over. So, yeah, I remember that one. That's so funny. That was the first one? Yeah, I think so. I think that was what they said. And I've seen them all, so, you know, it would have been like (laughs) starting the whole cycle over again. Um, But so the bell in the fog... Um, you're continuing Evander Mills' mm-hmm. um, story, and now he's in the city. He's not up north in the country house. Um, so what structure did you want to use in this book that would be sort of fun? I mean, I think what I was trying to follow is the sort of classic PI structure. You know, he's hired for a case. He uh, has, he goes around, he collects information and discovers sort of a set number of suspects who he interviews and tries to get to the heart of uh, along with collecting evidence. So in that sense, it, it follows the structure of Lavender House and that there's sort of a set cast and he's examining them and trying to get into their psychology as well as the actual structure of the crime. Um, But it's different in that it has a sort of greater scope because instead of this small house, we're seeing the a larger queer scene of 1950s San Francisco. There are different bars he goes to, which are all based on real historical bars. And um, we get to see him trying to find his way as a private investigator. So Susan Elia McNeil wrote a really interesting book, the name of which, Patrick, you're not going to be able to use the chat function to tell me what it is, um, set in uh, Hollywood in the 1930s, in which lavender marriages played a significant role, which was actually the first time I'd run across that term. What does lavender marriage mean? And is that one of the reasons you called your book Lavender House? Uh, Yes, uh, to the second part of the question. Um, So a lavender marriage is when a gay man and a lesbian would get married for appearance sake, usually if uh, one of them had a government job or if they were somehow in the public eye. Um, And, you know, you can't be confirmed from Bachelor Forever in the public eye. You definitely can't be an old maid in the public eye. So you have to get married. Um, and the uh, ways that they did that were they, they found other queer people. And that way you have this sort of outward heteronormative family and uh, you have your affairs on the side. So did it actually have to be a gay man? I wasn't entirely clear that it couldn't have been a woman and a heterosexual man as long as the guy sort of knew the score uh my understanding is they both have to be gay for it to be a lavender marriage otherwise uh you know the terminology is sort of cover or beard that's how i've always heard it well i had sort of a personal acquaintance with this some of you heard me say this before but rock hudson known as roy fitzgerald was my grandmother's mailman back in um now seriously um, in Winnetka, and then, you know, we all thought he was, you know, kind of this hunk and handsome, and then he went to Hollywood and all. And it was only when the AIDS ed- epidemic came along that everybody realized that this leading man who, you know, was constantly in bed with Doris Day, although they were usually in separate beds and <laughs> all the rest of it, uh, was gay. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, up until then, that whole, he was a romantic, heterosexual leading man. Um 
and I think, do you think that it was really the AIDS epidemic that made a lot of this public and people stop pretending? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that certainly the AIDS epidemic forced some people out of the closet because getting sick was synonymous with being queer, uh, with being out. And if you were seeking help for the illness in any way, shape or form, and you know, Rock Hudson famously went to Nancy Reagan, um, Mm -hmm. then you were, you were exposing yourself in that way. Um, uh, and certainly obviously also the, the physical toll of the disease became apparent in many ways. Although some people, uh, who passed of AIDS um, did manage to sort of hide it and say it was a blood disease or claim it was cancer or stuff like right. that. Um, but it, yeah, the eighties definitely resulted in a lot of things coming to light because of that. But I also think that um, after Stonewall, the whole game changed in terms of, you know, what was being discussed and how it was being discussed. Um because Sorry, that's, <laughs> we're going to eventually get that duckwork fixed, but it always sounds like I thought it was someone banging on down. the door. I was like, I oh know. boy. <laughs> it's like a thunderclap from Zeus. He's going to appear <laughs> any moment, right? Um, but was it? Oh, yeah. So the Stonewall uh, really shifted things. But what's interesting about that is we, we think of Stonewall as sort of the beginning of queer history in many ways. But actually, queer history, obviously, queer people existed before 1969. But also queer activism, queer community, queer culture all existed before 1969. And we never talk about that. And we never discuss the ways that being out or being closeted worked back then. And like one of the main components of that is like the lavender scare, which was a huge part of history that in many ways was bigger than the red scare, but we don't talk about that anymore. We don't talk about how newspaper headlines almost every day were reporting on how there were queer people in the government and that it was gonna, they were gonna um, uh, uh, betray the government. They were working for the Russians, etc. It must be disheartening to see us going backwards as we are currently doing. (laughs) But anyway, we're not here to be political. So let's go back to the 1950s. One of the things that became clear in Lavender House, and which becomes even clearer in The Bell and the Fog, was how dangerous. It was actually dangerous Mm -hmm. to be gay. I mean, you could, you know, lose your life, and particularly for um, your hero, uh, who was a cop until he was outed, so to speak, um, he lives in fear that um, if he's arrested or somehow comes to the attention of the San Francisco police that they will beat him up or kill him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, light spoiler in Lavender House, they do. <laughs> um, uh, and now he knows that if he is actively working as a PI uh, for the queer community, which is what he's doing here. He knows that if the police catch wind of that, that is going to be very bad for him. And there are a couple occasions where without getting too spoilery here, he is, uh, you know, hiding. He is freaking out because the cops come very close to finding him. So he's living over a, um, a nightclub, Mm -hmm. which is a haven for gay people in San Francisco. And one of the problems is he's not making enough money. And so there's a scene in which the cops who are on the take, you know, um, come because she isn't paying enough protection, the woman that's running the club. Um, And he feels terrible about it because, you know, it's partly his fault that yeah, this he has ha- happened. He has this deal with the owner of the club, Elsie, who was a character in Lavender House, uh, where she's essentially put him up. She's given him a studio apartment and an office over the Ruby, which is the gay club she runs. Um, and in exchange, he doesn't have to pay rent or anything, but he does have to uh, give her a give her a percentage of the take he gets from all the cases, um, and he isn't getting many cases because the gay community doesn't trust him because they know he used to be a cop and used to be aware of these raids uh, on the gay bars and did nothing to stop them. So they they don't really trust him, um, and uh, he is starting to feel 
like he really is a weight around, you know, Elsie's neck. Right. But he doesn't really know what else to do. Yeah, he's not he's sure. he's fired from the police department and, mm-hmm. you know, he's living kind of under threat anyway. Yeah, he was caught in a raid. Uh, the one raid he didn't get warning about because someone messed up uh, telling him what club they were going to hit that night. He was caught in a raid on a gay club at the beginning of Lavender House. So this was a fairly common thing that the police department would go out and, you know, as you say, hit up various clubs and the hope of what catching people in compromising positions or essentially. Yeah. So it's interesting Uh, from the period between 1952 and 1955, Gay bars were technically legal in the state of California, um, which the cops were very upset about. And what had happened was um, there was a gay club, the Black Cat, which is the one that Andy is caught in, actually. Um, And they... uh, they had been raided constantly and had their liquor license taken away and they could have their liquor license taken away because you weren't allowed to serve liquor in a place where gay people congregated because a place where gay people, where gay people congregated was considered a house of ill repute. Um, so like a, like a brothel essentially. So you, they couldn't have a liquor license, but the owner of the black cat who was a straight man sued the state of California. And he said, um, you know, we no, you that's, that's prejudice. You can't, uh, not serve people alcohol simply for being gay. And the Supreme court of California ruled with him. They said, you're right. You cannot, not serve people alcohol simply for being gay. However, <laughs> and they're like, this is all in the ruling. It's like very precise. You can still shut down this bar if they're doing anything gay in it. And that's not just like hooking up in the restroom. That's also dancing, um, any outward display of affection, anything that would essentially be characterized as a uh, 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 public display of inappropriateness. So was this all about moral police or was this, was it a witch hunt? I mean, what was the point of doing all these raids? Was it to um, it accelerate payoffs by people who own gay bars so that they would pay the cops more money? A lot of it was, yeah. There's actually a scandal, and I'm I'm hoping that the series continues long enough that I can get to this. There's a scandal. Oh, I don't remember the exact year. I think it might be early 60s. Um, and they call it the Gayola scandal, which is a combination of gay and payola, um, where uh, the, it was discovered just how many bribes the police department was taking from gay clubs in order to like stay uh, open. And it was a big thing because it was sort of like, oh, the police are okay with it, but also the police are corrupt and taking bribes. What's going on here? Um, so yeah, that it was a it was a big source of income. <laughs> <laughs> for the police but a lot of it also had to do with the lavender scare and this sort of post-war fear of queerness and this uh desire to um uh, to uh, oppress sort of deviant communities deviant meaning and not. also race too because yes they exactly were, they were constantly after so one of the things you point out in the book is that while um andy and James, who we'll get to, were serving in the Navy and aboard ship. Basically, you know, everybody knew that they were romantic partners. And as um, long as the ship functioned and, you know, the war was on, it, it was okay. So the, prob- the problem is now they're ashore, and it's a few years later. Why do you think it was okay in wartime? Well, it's interesting. World War II... Um, sort of created a lot of queer communities because of the draft. You have a situation where if you're the one gay guy in your small town and you're drafted, all of a sudden you're on this base with the one gay guy from all the other towns. And all of a sudden you're encountering other queer people and that forms a community. And so what the war and the draft inadvertently did was bring a lot of gay people together. And so for the first few years uh, of the war, 
essentially the the armed services weren't really aware of what they'd done as all these gay people found each other and started uh you know carrying on relationships and so in many cases yes they would fully make out on the ship and the captain would essentially be like guys can you just move aside so we can keep an eye on the horizon where the enemy ships are um but sometimes the the captain would fully just be like to the brig with both of you it really varied quite a lot but as the war went on and uh they the armed services realized they had all these gay soldiers um and and sailors they started sort of medicalizing it and uh this is sort of what led to a lot of the lavender scare as well because they they started classifying queer people like oh well if you just hooked up with a guy once while you were you know j- where all you hadn't seen women for a while and you know you were such and such position then you're not really homosexual we're gonna like send you to a therapist to talk it out for a while if however you know you've been doing this for a while then it, you we're gonna send you to the asylum where the 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 armed services sort of take on an asylum and we're going to blue card you, which is a way of essentially firing someone um, from the armed services and making sure they didn't get any of the benefits that most people got for serving. Um, And that led to a huge sort of uptick in the visibility of queer people uh, towards the end of the war. And with that visibility came people very angry at them (laughs) came the hate essentially. Uh, and you know, you, that's where the lavender scare comes from. That's where, uh, McCarthy sort of set it off. We all think of McCarthy as being the one who was like, the state department has 900 homosexuals or whatever it was. Um, uh, I don't remember the number, (laughs) but it really wasn't him. It was a few other guys who were really pushing the lavender scare agenda, but the papers went nuts with it. Are there deviants on like, you know, everywhere? It got to the point where if you worked for the state department, you had to, introduce yourself and immediately say, and I'm married with children because people would otherwise assume you were gay. It was everywhere. And it was because of the uh, sort of study of queer people that had happened in the war. So it went from in the early war, weirdly free and wild by the end of the war to deeply paranoid and terrifying. And that's why Andy sort of when he leaves the Navy immediately joins up with the cops because he's like, no one will suspect me here. He thinks this is a way to protect himself. Um, And it's also why the way James, who was his lover during the war, as well as one of his close friends, the way James leaves, leaves Andy very paranoid. Right. Well, and so it's James that comes to Andy. Um, Yeah. And now we're like seven years later. Right. Um, He comes to Andy as a client um, and Andy doesn't really want to deal with it. But on the other hand, since he's in this financial bind and not really, you know, cutting his nut for um, for the ruby, Mm -hmm. he has to take James on. And, you know, it's a sad story in lots of ways, you know, disappointments. And, you know, I don't I don't know how it would how it would be to live in a kind of constant surveillance state where the mm-hmm. stakes were so high. Did you ever see the movie Lawrence of Arabia? A while ago, yeah. Of course you did. Right, most of us did. And, you know, implicit in Lawrence of Arabia is the fact when these guys were out, you know, out, out in the desert fighting for for whatever, they, they were men having sex with each other because there wasn't anybody else to have sex with. And, you know, it's it's part of Lawrence of Arabia. I don't know how obvious that is to people watching it, but it was certainly very clear you know, that, that that that's what was happening. I'm sure that, you know, the British Navy, Columbus's voyage, all that stuff where men were all shut up together for, you know, <laughs> long periods of time. I mean, it it seems almost inconceivable that they... So the difference is, you know, did they do it out of convenience or did they do it out of inclination? And that is how the military started <laughs> classifying people as well. Right. I know. It's interesting you bring it out, though. It's almost like Facebook. You know, you got a number (laughs) of people together for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's what the Internet has done. It's created ways for people who are isolated. And it's been a big problem with bulimia, for example, is that, you know, there are like chat rooms for bulimics to tell you how to 
you know, beat the rap in the hospital and all it's the rest created of it. A lot of communities. Some it really has, and not not all of them for the better. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay, so are you into more of a Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler mode now rather than Agatha Christie in this? Book? I mean, yeah, I like. Well, yes and no. Like, I definitely think of them as still falling into the broader category of like the who done it, you know, which is what Christie and to an extent Chandler and Hammett did. Um but it is more uh it, because this the the scope of it is a little bigger and because it is it feels a little more urban, I think of it as being a little more Chandler esque. But as we were saying during dinner, you were pointing out to me, nah, you know, if you're in San Francisco, it really yeah. has to be Hammond. <laughs> I know Patrick's over there going, yes, indeed, because I mean Chandler <laughs> is really Los Angeles and um, they're very different cities, you know, very different, especially in the 50s, I mm -hmm. think, before there was a lot of homogenization. But, you know, we were also talking about the fact that people tend to fall into two camps. They either prefer Chandler or Hammett in the same way they either prefer Dorothy Sayers or Agatha Christie. And I think a lot of that is that people who are more plot driven like Hammett and Christie and people who are very much more interested in character tend to gravitate towards Chandler and Sayers, but that's just my take and I might be completely wrong there. No, I think that's brilliant. Like when you said at dinner, I was like, th yes, yes. That <laughs> like to me, that makes so much sense. Well, Patrick, speak up. Do you think that's a fair, um, Patrick knows a lot more about the PI uh, genre than I do. <laughs> you know, I mean, people don't really talk about the plots of Sayers nearly as much as they talk about their relationships and the characters. And yeah. right, mm. right, very literary language. And he is. I've never been able to read Red Harvest. I've really given it my best shot, and I'm just bored by it because it's so. Matter of fact, I guess I don't know what the word is, but yeah, no, that I like that, and that was the other thing I said at dinner. I was like, <laughs> "This is all my ego," but I hope I write more like Chandler, even if it is in San Francisco. <laughs> well, right. So I did, I did say to Liv that I thought one reason that Lavender House was very successful in the mystery world was because of the Golden Age sort of you know, structure and trope, harking back to Christie. Mm -hmm. And now if you're going to be sort of moving into the PI genre because you want to be running around an urban environment instead of, you know, in a country house in Marin County. I'm not ruling out future country houses. <laughs> no, but but also, and I mean, this is a really interesting thing to think about. There are ways to create a kind of a country house structure that don't require a country house. And I'm, I wish I could remember the title, but I've always remembered Rex Stout, one of his neural wolves. The entire story takes place inside a banquet room where Wolf and, you know, like I think it was 11 other people, they're gathered for some kind of society dinner or something, and somebody keels over. So the only people who could be the killers are the 11 people who didn't die and the waiters. That's it, you know. It, so it's not really any different. Mm -hmm. than the country house kind of thing, but it does take place in like, I think it's downtown New York or whatever it all is. So you can create that, you know, regardless. Oh yeah, of absolutely. You yeah. You could be in the hungry eye, for example. <laughs> you know, or... I mean, I think that, uh, you know, for me, part of the fun of getting into, getting into the Bell and the Fog was also being able to go to a more sort of, a place that reminded me of the noir movies I grew up with, the Bogart and Bacall. And so like being able to hit there felt really good, but I do think it still follows a lot of the same elements as sort of a Christie story in that, you know, it feels sort of limited in the, the way the characters uh, unfolds the, or the number of characters and the way they interact with each other. Um, but yeah, no, it is definitely a... He is running around a lot more. <laughs> okay, so he has James as a client. I, reluctantly, mm -hmm. he has taken on James as a client. And what's going on with James? We don't need to go too far in here, but what's the reason James has yeah. come 
to um, Andy. I'm so bad at talking about this because I'm afraid of spoilers. But yeah, James, it's sort of the the classic sort of trope of, he, you know, uh, Andy walks into his office and there's his ex. Um, and James is being blackmailed. He is is still in the Navy. Um, he is up for a major promotion and he is being blackmailed. Uh, he's not sure by whom, but the photos are of him and a, uh, essentially a male escort, a male prostitute who he sees from time to time, uh, at a hotel. And, um, the blackmailer is anonymously demanding some money be deposited in a locker. And, James doesn't have it, so he has come to the only gay PI in town who he has not real he did not realize until the moment Andy walked in was Andy. Um and so it is a very fraught moment for both of them. Yeah. Lots of past lots of past history. Uh, yeah. Of course we're in the we're in the moment here where, you know, photographs and negatives I mean, this is not the digital age, whatever it is. So to really quell blackmail, the whole goal was to get the negatives, wasn't it? Because mm-hmm. otherwise you could print an infinite number of photographs. So oh, it's yeah. always about the negatives if you're, <laughs> if you're back then. And he's looking for the negatives the whole time, too. And like, I, 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 I'm going to let you lead this conversation because I'm so afraid of spoilers. Yeah, that's I all we need to say. <laughs> okay. um, you know, and so there's a real probe of the past. They they have to go back and look at their time serving together mm-hmm. in the war and those attitudes. It gives you a chance to, to do that, to explore that, that yeah. history. And uh, the sort of there's sort of a mystery in that in the past too, right. including uh another old friend of theirs, uh Helen, who was um, a member of the Women's Auxiliary Navy. Um, so she was a driver, essentially, who worked on a naval base and would uh, would drive them into town, uh, and they would all go to these gay clubs together. All right. So there's a lot going on. I think crime fiction is a very protean form. I think it can embrace, um, you know, the genres are oftentimes fairly specific, but I think it can embrace an enormous range of characters, um, cultures, um, landscapes, whatever. And I noticed, and there's a very poignant um, afterward in this book, um, and thank you, uh, in which Lev points out he wasn't sure how the mystery community would embrace Lavender House and mentions a few booksellers that including me. I, I'm assuming that Barbara you are so actually I, me. I don't know how much you actually <laughs> remember, but... Uh, after I did a virtual event for Lavender House, and afterwards you you wrote me one of the kindest emails, Aww. and like I still have it. I mean, I, I I'm not someone who deletes emails generally, but it's in a special file folder to like look back on when I'm feeling down. And it was just very like you've done something special, <laughs> and I I like hearing that from you, a pillar of the mystery community, essentially, like made me feel like I had accomplished something. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very nice of you. But the reason I, I mentioned it was that I thought even today, there's still that question in your mind about whether a book featuring queer characters is going to be accepted. Oh, and, yeah. And, and I mean, that was before the current culture wars really took off. Mm-hmm. So I I was sort of sad in a way that you had to think about that, but I'm happy that some of us were gatekeepers that said, great. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because I do, I, my first couple books were about uh, straight women. <laughs> and that's because I felt like, and this is over a decade ago now, that's what I felt like I could sell. I didn't think people were going to be, I had queer side characters, but I didn't think anyone was going to be buying books starring queer people. And then all of a sudden in young adult, I saw gay books doing decently. And so I moved to young adult in many ways and I wrote uh, a couple gay books there and those did decently to the point where I sort of felt confident finally writing queer characters. And it wasn't until I wrote Lavender House and even the whole time I was writing it, I was like, I don't know, it's adult and it's genre. This doesn't, I don't know if this is going to be the place for it. And, you know, some editors even wrote back, no mystery has no interest in this. Um, but then once, once it came out, 
there were so many people who were so welcoming and I was, I was shocked. I really thought it was going to be like a, <laughs> I really thought it was going to be a lot harder in many ways than it's been. And it's still, you know, not, not easy. Publishing a book is never easy. Um, but the welcome I've received from the mystery community uh, was a lot warmer than I I had been led to believe it might be. And uh, that was really meaningful. And especially, you know, I have a writing group um, who I've been with since graduate school. So like long time, a right? very long time. And when they read Lavender House, they were like, oh, they literally called it the book you were meant to write. So it really felt like I was putting a piece of myself out there that was a lot more intimate than the other pieces of myself I put out there into a, a new area that I was really uncertain about. And so the welcome, you know, the Anthony nomination, the McCavity nomination yeah. that that's been just astounding to me, like just above my hopes and dreams. <laughs> I'm glad it worked out that way for you. And, you know, I think it's interesting. Riley Sager, for example, is gay, has a husband, whatever, but he doesn't write gay characters. He writes, you know, psychological, well, some of them are, now that I think about it. But, you know, and this doesn't seem to be. So do you think the difference is not who you are, but what you, who are you writing that, you know? Uh, yeah, I think it's more about who you're writing and the way you're writing it. So, like, uh, it, some of the passes I got from editors, I shouldn't be talking about this, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of the passes I got from editors were very much, um, well, you know, if it was just a gay detective, we could do that. That's interesting. But a whole queer cast, that's too much. That's too niche. That's too limited. You know, most mystery readers are straight and they're not going to be interested in that. Yeah, how do they know that? That's I have really no idea. That's a interesting question. You know, I don't know that even I would say most mystery readers yeah. are straight any more than I'd say most mystery. I, I get annoyed. And I suppose statistically it may be true, but I really hate it when they talk about, you know, no, most readers are women. Mm -hmm. And I look around at, you know, at our audiences in Al Patrick and I think, you know, oftentimes we have more men or it's 50-50. And, you know, there are all sorts of authors like Tony Hillman when he was still alive, now Anne, um, you know, where they were basically unisex. C.J. Box, um, Craig Johnson, all these. I'm not even going into the military fiction guys because that's <laughs> a different thing, but... You know, it's never been our experience, has it? Except, um, well, occasionally, like the B.E. Schwab. I wasn't here, but I'm assuming that was almost all women. I think the fantasy romance tends to tends to pull that kind of a thing. But I don't think the mystery audience is heavily... The what? The cozies? Oh, yeah. I think... Well, cozies are basically romances with a, you know, with a body. I mean, well, they are, you know, I mean, they, yeah, and recipes and, you know, cute bookstores and <laughs> antique stores and, and it's fine. I mean, it's escape reading in almost its purest form, you know, and I, I think that it's great that, you know, if people um, gravitate towards that, especially, I mean, I'm getting to the point where I can hardly read the paper in the morning. I don't even want to read the front pages anymore. So the pull of the cozy mm -hmm. <laughs> or historical fiction is, I think, quite powerful right now. You know, it's a way of, of kind of ducking out of the current mess that we're <laughs> all in. I mean, yeah, I, I love a good cozy as well. I think that the appeal is also just about there's... And I, I guess it's, I'm saying the same thing that you just said. It's about sort of a level of safety. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's a safe, it's a safe place, mm -hmm. whether it's a bakery or a bookstore or an antique stop, shop or a chocolate, whatever. And also most of them are small town rather. I mean, the economics, I, it just cracks me up. That's the one thing I have trouble with is that, you know, the, the economics of these little adorable towns that people say cozies in, um, <laughs> there is absolutely no way that a business could be sustained <laughs> by the 400 people living in the small town on the shores of Lake Michigan and, you know, supporting the chocolate shop. It's just not, <laughs> it's just not happening. Um, so you do have to suspend you know, mm -hmm. belief in a in a bigger way. 
I think. I always joke I'm going to set a chess, uh, a cozy in the, the small town. My parents have a place in Chester, Connecticut. Yeah. It's very small. Uh, they used it for a Lifetime Christmas movie. That's the kind of town this is. They it. filmed it. And I'm like, yes, this will be perfect. It's like a one main street. I have no idea what would happen in this town. But Okay, but on the other hand, I am deep into what I think is the best David Baldacci I've ever read called The Edge. I'm going home and get right back into it. And it takes place in a tiny small town in Maine and it's fabulous and it's a it's a thriller I mean it's a real thriller See, with that's, that potential spies and all the rest of it makes more sense to me. maybe it's because like I'm a born and raised city boy but small towns are creepy <laughs> Tess Gerritsen has a book set in a different small town in Maine too so I don't think that small town automatically suspends just Maine you know <laughs> maybe just Maine <laughs> I think the other statistic, which I thought was fascinating, is something like 90% of Maine is forest. It is a, mm. it is a higher forest landscape, a um, percentage of landscape is forest than any other state. I would have thought Minnesota, or but no, it turns out to be Maine. Huh. And I've actually driven around in upper Maine down the Aroostook River and all or No, that's not the name of it. And, you know, I can see why there were big paper mills in Maine and all the rest of it because of the. But anyway, my point is that a small town is not necessarily just adapted to a cozy. It yeah, can, no, it can they're be creepy. Just a really they're very creepy. Baldacci. God, it's such a Especially good book. those towns where like everyone knows everyone else's business. Oh man. Yeah. Creepy. I've, lived, I've lived in a small town and you know, I'd rather be anonymous <laughs> <laughs> all the way around. Well, I'm so glad that you um have written a sequel to the Lavender House and you've got a third book, you've said already yeah. on the wing, right? Yeah, I turned in the the I'm waiting for edits, which I think I'll get Monday, and I just saw some cover concepts. It's oh. yeah. No, I'm really excited, and it there's a the a big bookstore happening in it. So, oh well, that'll yeah. be absolutely wonderful. So, is that a little schizoid for you to be here talking to us about the <laughs> Bell in the Fog? While meantime, your publisher wants to discuss covers for your next. book? Yeah, no, it's definitely a little like, oh right, I got to get back at that. We're not talking about because I can talk so much more fluently about the third book than I can about the second right now because it's so fresh in my mind, and so it is a little like, what did I write? Let me remember well, that's what why that I'm one sitting was. here. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm really serious. It was one of the very first events we did. Do you remember that? No, you weren't here then. It was probably 1991 or two of Walter Satterthwaite. It was his first appearance at the Poison Pen. And we had a, a group in the little tiny original Poison Pen, which was like the size of this over here. You know, it was like 600 square feet. And I could see, as I sat down to listen to Walter, that he had absolutely no idea what the book he was there to talk about <laughs> was about. I mean, he was like, he was just a total blank. So I got up, you know, because I read it because he was here, and I got up and started talking to him. And in that moment, I realized that you really can't expect an author to come and talk about a book that is just out because most of the time... It's old news to them. Oh, yeah, no, like 18 months ago. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we interview authors who come here. You know, it's, it's just Yeah, no, someone to jog our memory. We need it. We need it. <laughs> well, it's true. And I can easily understand that, that the creative process is such that you've already moved on. So does anyone here have a question that they would like to ask? Sure. All right, wait, let me, just for the camera, um, she's asking a question about what um, Lev's research project process for LBQ2 history, uh, which is an important part of the book. Mm -hmm. um, well, for the queer history specifically, I used a lot of sort of articles and whatnot, but two large primary texts. The big one that I've used for uh, both books and will be using for all books going forward is called Wide Open Town, and it's a queer history of San Francisco up until 1965. And it's by Nan Alamilla Boyd, and it's fantastic. It's like my Bible for these books. And then for the World War II stuff, um, I read a book called Coming Out Under Fire by Alan... 
Barubi is how I think we're pronouncing his last name, or I've been told to pronounce his last name. Um, there's an accent mark. It's French Canadian, I think. Uh, so, uh, and that is literally about sort of the the queer soldiers and sailors of World War II, and as I was saying, the way it created these queer communities. And like, there's so many more stories. There's such great stories from the war about these queer communities, including like. Once they were uh, institutionalized, a lot of these gay men uh, would like put on drag shows in these asylums. They like were thrilled. They found each other in these places, and uh, so you yeah, have a drag queen story hour. In yeah, the, in the in asylum. The <laughs> I love it. With the usually with the uh, doctors like joining it, not joining it necessarily, but like applauding watching <laughs> they were they were fine with it wonderful anybody else patrick are there any questions online yeah jamie oh boy i mean it varies a lot what does my writing process look like was the question um i try to get up and write forward as soon as i'm awake uh you know after i've like uh checked my email briefly and uh you know had breakfast that's when i write forward i don't worry about edits in the morning because opening your day with edits is like i know a lot of writers do it because it reminds you but to me you end up just getting stuck in the same pages over and over again because you're like oh well i'm gonna edit this so you know you and then you wake up the next day and you edit it again you edit it again it, it becomes sort of a mire for me so i just try to write forward and um Usually I don't outline too much, but I do know where I'm headed, uh, you know, climax wise. And I outline like a couple chapters ahead. Sometimes I'm required to submit an outline, in which case I have a whole outline and that's fine. Um, but yeah, get up in the morning. Don't worry about editing first thing. Just write and only loosely outline. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You know, I've just just spotted the full glory of your socks <laughs> <They're great. laughs> which i think are fabulous sort of going with your shirt um lavender i assume is the theme oh yeah a friend made me this shirt oh yeah yeah isn't it great it's so it's got flowers on it and then it also looks like the flowers are stained with blood so i love it <laughs> it's very good but the socks really pick it up oh yeah no the socks well, absolutely uh, match right it. <laughs> well, thank you very much Lev. it was really wonderful thank you. to talk to you Actually, we had a great um zoom conversation last year which you can if you go to youtube and um go to the poison pen channel you can look up lev ac rosen and what we're talking about last year about yeah the lavender house can i show you one thing about the book of course yeah so i have an amazing cover designer and cover artist i'm very lucky and it has beautiful end pages and papers uh, -huh. uh which oh, are these yeah. and actually if it were cooler in arizona i have um a jacket i've been wearing with a pocket square with this pattern which i love Ooh. um but it's way too hot here <laughs> 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 i landed and i was like what is it and it was literally a hundred degrees um, but in the very back in October, even, <laughs> even more insulting, right? <laughs> yeah, I was I, I came from Houston. It was balmy in Houston. And then there's a little secret here under the dust jacket with the oh, torn thing. Yeah. yeah. And there and what's fun is that the Lavender House hardcover has a matching secrets, let's say. And then here on the back, I don't know if you could see it online, but at the spot gloss there's oh, like, I see it. Yeah, there's right. a secret little ruby, you, which is if you sort of twiddle the book, you'll yeah. see it. Come and up. so all those sort of like little secret things are also in the lavender house in the same place. So that's, that's really a brilliant piece of design. Isn't oh it? yeah, no, yeah. she's so good. She's and, so know, good. I have to say that for a long time, Forge was primarily known to me anyway um, as a publisher of science fiction and fantasy. Um, they didn't do a lot of mystery, although if you remember, Patrick Jeff Parker published his first couple of books before. But boy, have they upped their game and changed it, and they are now a formidable yeah. mystery well, publicist. We have. Um, I think Tor is still doing the. Tor is doing yeah, the, the science fiction. They kind of split it up. But we have Spencer Quinn coming on Tuesday. He's another mystery author mm -hmm. with Forge, and haven't you noticed that they are really doing some great work but it's an amazing team there it really is but 
as part of the fact that they are successful, they can afford to do this kind of thing, uh-huh. you know, because they're not operating on a shoestring. But I'm really glad you pointed all that design out. Oh, yeah, no, I think it needs Yay. to be appreciated. It's so great. No, David Rosenfeld's with Minotaur, but it's all Macmillan. So, you know, basically the same company. Um, um, Lauren Esselman is, is Forge, yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of writers are doing extremely well. Plus, what they're doing is they're killing it with fantasy right yeah. now and, um, and science fiction because, as you and I discussed at dinner, how genres roll up and roll down. Mm-hmm. Right now, romance and um, fantasy are way up and crime fiction is down and you know it it'll it'll change again well i have a ya romance out next month so i'm covering all my bases i love it (laughs) right anyway thank you all very much online audience for joining us this evening we appreciate it thank you all for coming and if you'd like love to sign your books or chat with him now that we're not in public. And I want to thank our canine oh, uh, who's hi. peacefully through I thought you were going to jump in my yeah, lap. There she is again. I thought you were going to jump in my Kyrie. lap. Oh, you're such a good girl. <laughs> Roll over so you can get a tummy scratch. Right. <laughs> Yay, thank you so much. Oh, it was a pleasure.